I've never met a conservative who calls himself corporatist, right. but I've met a lot of corporatists on Capitol <laughs> Hill who call themselves conservative. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today I'm happy to say we're talking with the one and only Ralph Nader about his latest book, Unstoppable, the emerging left-right alliance to dismantle the corporate state. Ralph, thanks for talking to Reason TV. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, born in 1930, you are one of... By 34. Oh, I'm sorry. Born in 1934, <laughs> my mistake. I, uh, yeah. You are one of the most influential public policy advocates or social figures of the past 50, 60, 70, let's call it the post-World War II era. You've been on Sesame Street, Saturday Night Live, The Ali G Show, everything else. Your first big book was Unsafe at Any Speed in 1966. You followed that up with the Nader Report on the FTC, which might have been as influential in a lot of ways. You've created organizations like Public Citizen, uh, as well as all the perks that college students especially know about. In Unstoppable, you write about what you call the emerging left-right alliance to dismantle the corporate state. Talk about corporatism. How do you define it, and why, are, why do you see the left and the right kind of coming together to say enough already? Well, corporatism is, is a worldview that large corporations should manage our political economy, and they should strategically plan it, and things will come out okay. It's part of the overall globalization. Uh, which undermines local, state, and national sovereignty, and which uh, pulls down economies to the lowest level what's, of countries overseas. What's the role? Uh, what's the kind of growth pe curve of corporatism? Is this something that, in a lot of ways, starts with the New Deal, um, and then kind of extends into the post-war era of you know the government or the state and corporations saying, "Okay, we're going to work together to stabilize everything." Well, that's one, it's sort of an emergency partnership, but I think the, uh, the marker was around 1979 when Congressman Democrat from uh, California, Tony Coelho, persuaded the Democrats they could raise a lot of money from corporate sources, mm -hmm. just like the Republicans. And from then on, you could see the decline in public hearings on corporate mis misfeed malfeasance. You can see the decline of enforcement of health and safety standards. Uh, doctrines like deferred prosecution, uh, they never had to plead guilty, the corporations, they cut deals. And you see the increase, enormous increase in uh, PACs, in commercial PACs, political action right. committees. And that's to lobby the government, to yeah. rig markets. To right. Their, you know. And, and, and they're, uh, they're given to both Democrat and Republicans. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, do you see a, a strong difference or a meaningful difference overall between the Obama administration's policies and George W. Bush's? Or is it, is it continuity or is it rupture? It's very much continuity. Uh, obviously, on social services, there are differences. Mm -hmm. Medicare, for example, Medicaid. Uh, Social Security. However, on the power areas, uh, is there much of a difference on militarization of foreign policy right. between Bush and o Obama? Is there much of a difference between uh, bailing out Wall Street and perpetuating right. a corporate welfare state, which libertarians call crony capitalism? Right. No. Yeah. Is there much of a difference in the, in the money in politics? Well, maybe in the Supreme Court there is, but you, you go up to Capitol Hill and they're both dialing for dollars like crazy. What, uh, yeah, what did you think when in 2008 and you know, just a couple of weeks before the election, it was amazing to me when John McCain, uh, you know, because a lot of people yeah. on the left and a lot of people on the kind of libertarian end of the right will say, you know, there's really not much difference. And it was amazing in 2008 when John McCain suspended his campaign to come back and vote for TARP, which Obama also voted for. And it seemed a kind of signal moment, a, you know, a flare almost that these guys are That's effectively right. very very much alike. They're very much uh, uh, invested in the corporate state. Mm -hmm. That's what corporatism is. Franklin Roosevelt in 1938 sent a message to Congress to set up an investigative commission on concentrated corporate power. It's called the TNEC. In the message he said whenever government is controlled by private economic power that's fascism. Those were his right. exact words. And obviously World War II gave fascism another dimension. Mm -hmm. But the combination of corporate and government power, so that government becomes basically a service uh, arrangement mm -hmm. for corporations, uh, is what we call uh, corporate government, corporate state, and what you call crony capitalism, and that's where the convergence 
by left right should focus on. Okay, and let well, let's get to a couple of cases of that. But here here is uh, you know specific examples. Would you grant though that in a in a true free economy, one that is you know kind of predicated upon you know individual buyers and sellers doing things, could a company legitimately without using the state grow to a massive size where it controlled 60, 70, or more percent of a market? Or do you think, by definition, any company that controls a certain percentage of, of a market needs to be regulated, or could have only gotten that way because of regulation? Well, I think if they, if they have a monopoly patent, for example, on a drug, they're going to have 100% of the market mm -hmm. for you know, almost 20 right. years. The other uh, theme is uh, they grow because they get huge amounts of taxpayer-funded research and development. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the major emerging industries, the biotech industry, the computer semiconductor industry, the, a lot of the pharmaceutical industry, the containerization industry, uh, the, uh, these are industries that grew as a result of free transmission of government research and development. What, what's from the percentage of that, though? Because uh, pharmaceutical companies, mm. I mean, it, it basically, for example, it, you know, there's definitely some research that gets done at yeah. state-funded universities or yeah. through government grants. But it's costing pharmaceutical companies a billion dollars in 10 years to bring a drug to market. They're putting up virtually all of that. Uh, and, and there's risk involved. Yeah, well, as, as, first of all, uh, most of the important drugs have uh, NIH research-sponsored mm -hmm. input. Mm -hmm. In fact, three-quarters of the anti-cancer drugs, mm -hmm. the drugs like Taxol, for example, uh, very much. And it's given to them essentially free right. with no reasonable price restraint. So, and are you saying then if there's a, if there's a certain percentage of free money or government-supported yeah. research going into something, yeah. the government has the right to regulate that or... What? Well, because it's it, a right to get yeah. some uh, perceived return for the mm -hmm. taxpayer, and there is no return. Okay. So when, but uh, living longer or anything well, like that. But but that's a good benefit. That's yeah. why they do it. But for example, in Taxol, uh, in 2000, a woman with ovarian cancer mm -hmm. uh, wrote me and showed that she would have to pay uh, $14,000 for six treatments mm -hmm. uh, to Bristol Myers Squibb. Well, right. the, Bristol Myers Squibb got that. Uh, right through the clinical testing, free mm -hmm. from okay. the NIH. So what should she have had to pay, or should she have not had well, to pay? Well, I believe anything? that if the taxpayer pays for the intellectual property, right. for the assets, there should be reasonable price provisions, because by definition, the government is giving a monopoly to Bristol-Myers right. uh, So Square. then do we get, uh, and I, I don't yeah. want to, we'll move yeah. to a separate area, but yeah. uh, does that mean actually, why don't we get rid of patents then? Well, that, or, yeah. or why, I mean, are you saying that nobody should pay more than $5,000 a year for any drug maximum? Or how, do, you know, because I think, I think there's a general sense of fairness that everybody would agree with that, you know, you, you, if the government funded something that leads to something, and, and the, yeah. that's, I think, a more difficult thing to determine than yeah. you might. But, uh, yeah, you know, then there should be some return. But then the question is, like, well, if, you know, if Bristol Myers Squibb is only going to get five thousand dollars a year from patients, they're not going to do it because it's not worth their time. Well, it is worth their time because they didn't spend any money uh, creating okay, the drug yeah. and testing. So drug. the billion I, I dollars, think the patent, yeah, the, the monopoly right. patent is antiquated for drugs. Okay, they should get an, a reward, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a monetary reward for creating a drug. Okay, uh, and, but. The, the patent is just, it's a, it's a pay or die situation. Yeah. There's this Gilead science, which you've read mm -hmm. about. They're charging now $1,000 a pill for six weeks. But, $1, but a think pill. about it. I mean, you know, I, some drugs yeah. are worth that, right? If, if they're going to save your life, if they're, if they're the only thing that might save your life, you know, I, I mean, we could agree that certain things are worth paying a thousand bucks a yeah, shot. Yeah, but if for. you run that through the economy, you know, it's worth uh, paying a uh, million dollars for an ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Especially okay. since government research helped make that possible. Well, let's talk about a, a yeah. place of convergence because your book is actually about. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a map of saying, okay, look, people on the right and people on the left yeah. across the political spectrum, and you know, orthogonal to it and everything. Mm -hmm agree nobody likes nobody except the direct beneficiaries really like yeah. corporate welfare crony capitalism whatever you call it and you tell an interesting story uh, in the book about how you help push airbags into being uh, and that it actually started not through a government mandate but 
you went and talked to the, the guy who purchased vehicles for the federal government. Yes. Talk a little bit about that process. Yes, uh, the, the government is a big consumer. It right. buys almost everything we buy, food, energy, transportation, plus missiles, which we don't they buy. buy. Uh, let's be clear, though, the government buys a lot more prostitutes than I think either you or I do. <laughs> That's another issue. Okay. Uh, and, and the agency is called the General Services Administration. So I uh, learned that the agency buys about 45,000 vehicles a year for government employees to do their business. And I went down and it, lo and behold, this, this man was a libertarian, right wing, supporter of Reagan, a former auto parts dealer in New Hampshire. Right. And Ger he's, he's like, the government shouldn't really be buying much of anything and it should get the best deal that it can. That's right. Yep. Save the taxpayer, right. save the lives. And it worked. Yeah. And he, he put out a bid and GM knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. So they accosted him at a social uh, meeting, uh, gathering, and said, you shouldn't do this, Mr. Carmen. And he said, well, you know, the customer is always right, right? Yeah. So Ford bid and on 5,000 uh, Ford Tempos to put airbags, and, and the rest is history. So, But uh, here is, I guess, a question, because I, I find that story and a lot of the stories in the book yeah. just fascinating, because there is, and I know you've worked with people like Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform. Yeah. You know, so there, there, and you know, we see this all the time, where especially on things like military spending and national surveillance, civil liberties, huge convergence between huge. the right and the left in a way that's genuinely different than 25 years ago. But then at some point, why, if, if airbags make sense, why should they be forced onto the auto industry as opposed to wouldn't consumers say, you know, nobody, nobody had to make VCRs mandatory or remote controls for VCRs yeah. mandatory. The market drove that. Wouldn't it, isn't it enough of a demonstration project to say, hey, here's a way you can save federal employees' lives and overall money, and why wouldn't that have worked in the general population? Well, it, it, it ended up working. There mm -hmm. was a, a mandatory standard for airbags as a result of the success of But the, I'm saying, why yeah. make the standards oh, mandatory? Oh, because you want to save lives, police power. I mean, why have police yeah. in towns to save your life? But, but yeah. I, by the same token, you didn't, I mean, there w was not a recall of all, uh, you know, cars that didn't have airbags at the same time. So we recognize this is going to be phased in. What's wrong with allowing more of a voluntary opt-in rather than mandating a, uh, you know, a perceived, this is the be one best way, let's mandate it for everyone. Because it saves lives. I mean, it's like fire prevention codes, you know? It's, uh, it's like having uh, brake standards. It's like having... Uh, no, no, and yeah, I get all of yeah, that, yeah, but, yeah. but we understand that there's always gonna be a phase in, because we don't actually say, okay, when we yeah. up fire standards, we don't tear down yeah. all the old buildings and oh, rebuild yeah. well, you them. you can rely on the auto companies to coerce a phase in. <laughs> they keep yeah. delaying no, no, and delaying. Yeah, yeah, no, no, well, and we'll talk more about right. the, uh, the auto uh, companies, which are near and dear to your heart. Right. You, are you do not own a car? No. Okay, and is that because of the auto companies or nobody will sell you one or <laughs> no actually okay. if I bought a car they would uh, advertise it that's true uh, oh so I, that's a different problem <laughs> okay well you know one of the things uh, you in in the book yeah. and and to go back to this question of convergence which yeah. I think a lot of libertarians would be very interested in and you've been working with yes. you know various groups on things is that you revisit the agrarians of the yeah. 1920s and 30s. Uh, you know, these are people on the old right. You have some kind words about Ludwig von Mises in mm -hmm. the book and say that he's often misrepresented by mm -hmm. uh, what you would consider corporate capitalism. As well as Adam today. Smith, yeah, and yeah, Frederick and, Hayek. And yeah. even people like Marx. I mean, you know, yeah. it's clear that their contemporary people who invoke them often yeah. distort them to their own purposes. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about what you find powerful about the agrarians in particular, because you spend a lot of time talking about people like Alan Tate and a few others. Yes, well, they were reporters, poets, farmers, uh, people who call, would call themselves conservatives. Right. And uh, th they had a very sophisticated philosophy of power. First of all, they believed in the first principle of capitalism, which is defied by Wall Street, which is if you own property, you should have some reasonable control mm -hmm. over it. Okay, whereas investors today own the corporations, but they have very little control mm -hmm. over the bosses and their pay. And so what they argued was that the only way you could have uh, a democratic society is if you decentralize property ownership. In those days, they talked about land because the small farmers were being right. overtaken by the large farms. But they also talked about shares. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, if we have shares in companies, we want to control it and we should have decentralization of shares as well. 
the amazing thing about it is they defied the Marxists and the New Dealers. Right. They felt the New Dealers were ready to be taken over by the big corpor corporations and the corporate state, which right. is what they feared. Right, so and I which thought you, you would agree that that effectively happened oh, yeah. in the post-war oh, yeah. era. You know, it's yeah. AT&T, and what's good for General Motors is good for the yeah. USA. And they're remarkably out. prescient. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's such a fresh uh, chapter mm -hmm. in the book, because people say, I don't, had no idea, you know, that right. people actually did this. Now, do you worry at all, uh, you know, because yeah. I look back um, and there's a guy who was kind of, not a, an agrarian, but talked in the 40s yeah. and 50s and 60s, Arthur E. Kirch, a political scientist, who talked a lot about decentralizing power. That, that's the basic principle of liberal, you know, yeah. classical liberalism. That's right. Um, but, you know, the, the agrarians were also, they were very anti-capitalist yeah. uh, in the sense they were, you know, they tended to come from the South. Most of them were overt racist. People like Alan Tate was, uh, you know, a, a racial supremacist in, in a way that's extremely, you know, it's, it's not even conscionable today. But is there a problem that they wanted to de keep things decentralized in a way to preserve their status quo at the cost of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, our ancestors? people who were streaming over from the yeah. Middle East or from uh, Southern Italy or Southern Europe into cities, because that's where cities were, you know, cities and capitalism were the place where people had more opportunities. I mean, do you there's, worry about that? There, yeah, there's probably some, there's something that they didn't mention African-Americans, except yeah. uh, the sharecroppers. They right. thought that was an atrocity. Right. Uh, but they, they definitely, didn't mention, they didn't want their sister to marry one yeah, either. Well, yeah. that's, those were the yeah. times, right? And they didn't mention women. Mm -hmm. Except that in, in the book, right. there's a woman who taught at Vassar who right. just ripped the hell out of the men and right. yeah. went after the suffragists saying, you freed us and then you didn't follow up. Right. And, and then the women right. didn't follow up. You know, They were just like the men. Yeah. So you see, they were breaking some of the boundaries right. of, uh, of, of bigotry. Were and you and always prejudice. into these guys? And it's just you're talking about them more now or is it something that you discovered over, you know, over the course of your career? Oh no, I, I discovered them in the course of this yeah. research for Unstoppable. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, well here, and let me, uh, before we move into uh, other topics, let me ask you, because uh, these are, and I'm thinking about this in terms of like, how can Ralph Nader make the best pitch to a libertarian audience yeah. for, you know, uh, for things. But you, you talk, in the book about workfare as a Clinton era mischief, um, that um, and you 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 at a certain point attack people on the left as well as on the right for saying you know Clinton because uh, liberals did not look at the hard edges of various kinds of social welfare programs they yeah. allowed them to get so bad that then they then they were going to be reformed and oftentimes the reform was not particularly useful mm -hmm. um, and. You talk about workfare basically as a sop to corporate America. Uh, we can discuss that a little bit. Uh, and then you also say that about other types of things like, uh, you know, that uh, people on the left didn't attack unions for being really repressive and suppressive yeah. of their own workers. And, except you know, does, except yeah. Does, yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah. talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the idea that workfare was not a, a positive reform of the welfare system. And what should have happened then? Well, basically because it, there weren't any jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea of cutting a, a single mom off at $300 a month uh, when there were really no jobs or, but she, wait, couldn't, but or this, she couldn't get or she couldn't okay. get transportation, you know, to yeah. go from the inner city to the suburbs. So what should we do? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting yeah. in the book is that you're not saying, you know what, this, you, you're not saying the status quo is, is yeah. preferable to what should be. Yeah. Um, but it's clear that like our social welfare spending, yeah. and I would include Social Security and Medicare in yeah. that, we have a system where if you're well connected politically and if you're wealthy, you can get a lot of government money, and then it gets harder the less political power you have. What is a, what's a social welfare state that you would want to see implemented? Well, look at this. Milton Friedman uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> created the minimum incomes plan that Nixon adopted right. and uh, proposed to Congress, and Congress didn't pass it. Now, that is a reflection of a long tradition of conservative philosophers. Mm -hmm. For example, Frederick Hayek was opposed to Medicare and Medicaid because it wasn't universal. Mm -hmm. He didn't like discriminatory right. service. He talked about social insurance. Mm -hmm. And these uh, revered conservative philosophers, mm -hmm. which are used by Congressman Paul Ryan and others and misused, they actually believed in public works. They believed in uh, social insurance. They believed in uh, basically paying a decent wage. I mean, right. uh, Adam Smith would say, you know, 
the workers are the economy. How can you not pay them a decent wage? Okay, well, two things, and let's yeah. talk about the wages in a second. Yeah. Uh, because you're right about, you know, Friedman proposed the plan, and it, it ended up in a very distorted way becoming the earned income tax credit, yeah. which does something different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, a guaranteed minimum income, essentially, yeah. or a negative income. Uh, what, um, you know, would Hayek say, well, Medicare is okay because if everybody had it, because it's already killing the country, it's already bankrupting the country, there's no way to control its costs, or is it that we need a true social safety net, which would not be based on age, it would be based on need, and it would be, it would be universally uh, available, but it would be much smaller than it is now. Well, that's the principle of Medicaid, yeah. but we know how hard it is to even get on Medicaid if you're poor and you don't have children. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that, those, well, are, all, those yeah. are all administrative details that are very important, mm -hmm. but the overall principle is nobody should die because they can't pay. Right, okay. Uh, well, let's talk about the wages then, because yeah. you uh, you attack Walmart uh, in the book. Uh, Walmart, you you say at a, a point, and I'm quoting: Walmart has been the leader with a low wage policy it has mercil mercilessly inflicted on its workers and its domestic producers. Yeah. Talk about that, and what are the effects of? That? Okay, there are about a million Walmart workers who make less today than 1968 adjusted for inflation, mm -hmm. because the minimum wage has been stagnant, and it's now at seven and a quarter. If it was adjusted for inflation, <clears throat> they would be making about ten dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Let me think. Okay. So, all right, we start with this. Uh, Costco starts at eleven fifty an hour plus benefits. How many people does it employ compared to Walmart? Well, I mean, to probably yeah. two, three hundred. And you got to pay you yeah. got to pay a membership fee just to get into Costco. No, well, that's true, but okay. so it's more expensive. But there's a reason. Yeah. It's not more expensive, according to the CEO of Costco, because they have far less employee turnover. Yeah. They have more worker productivity. And he said it's the right thing to do. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it stimulates the economy. I mean, consumer demand stimulates the economy. I'm thinking from the consumer point of view, yeah. there's no question Costco, I mean, it has a different set of items yeah. for sale. It's more expensive than Walmart. You can go into Walmart and get a shirt a, and a meal for a couple bucks. You're not, you gotta, you gotta pay, what, 50, 60 bucks just to walk in the door at Costco. Yeah, but you see there's other factors here. Yeah. Walmart basically has told its suppliers in the U.S., can't meet the China price, uh, shut down and go to China, right. we'll buy your products and mm -hmm. ship them back here. Uh, Walmart's CEO makes $11,000 an hour, eight hours a day, and you know that's crony capitalism with the board of directors, you know, the, the rubber stamp board of directors. Yeah. That's okay. not a market. Okay. Yeah. But here's, here's the rub uh, uh, that, that's really important here. In the last six, seven years, Walmart has spent $51 billion buying back its stock, mm -hmm. which really helps the Walton family, of course, who got stock and so on. If they had, if, if they had decided to pay their workers mm -hmm. with that $51 billion, which is not a very productive way to use capital, uh, they would give them a $3.50 an hour raise for all their workers. Mm -hmm. right? So they, this is where they prefer to put their money. Now, where are the investors of Walmart? They don't have any any role in mm -hmm. deciding how. Well, it's a it's publicly gonna, traded company. Yeah, right? but the so, investors okay. are, are powerless. Well, here, let me let me. I, and I don't necessarily disagree. And yeah. I uh, disagree that the idea that investors and it may be that investors don't do what we would like them to yeah. do, or that they are fully yeah. disempowered. But uh, you know, there's there's real questions. And you know, one of the people that you quote in the book in several places is David Stockman, who yeah. is a friend of reasons and a fascinating person who does not fit into a traditional <laughs> left-right spectrum, and there's right. more of him speaking up now. But Walmart, according to a 2005 study by the Brennan Justice Center, which yeah. is not a right-wing organization yeah. or a Walton Foundation, you know, family thing, yeah. they uh, said that the average worker at Walmart was making $19,000 a year, which at that time, this is 2005, was more than the average worker at other discount retailers like Kmart and Target. It was a little bit less than uh, at a UFCW supermarket if you were in the union, but overall supermarket workers, it was the same. Yeah. I mean, so are they actually paying their workers less than what the market bears, or are you saying the market is so rigged that we're getting these people on the cheap? Well, the latter, obviously. I mean, I don't know where Brennan got the data because we can't get that data okay. from Well, they got Walmart. it from a leaked document from yeah. Walmart. But you so. see, you know, you know the, yeah. the, uh, the statistical uh, shenanigans when you say average, mm -hmm. right? You want to ask yourself, 
how many people in Walmart are now making less than 1968? And it's almost a million workers. Yeah, but it's also, are they working the same number of hours? Are they, no, are no, just households the same no, size, No, no, no we're not talking yeah. about full pay. They have a lot of, you're right, they have a lot of part-time. We're talking yeah. about the but I mean, But pay. yeah, I mean, I guess this is, this is I think, and, remains yeah. a point of contention between libertarians and, and your, yeah. your method of things, because Costco is a great company. Yeah. It's a great business. Uh, it's a great business model, yeah. but it's one of many. Walmart also, you know, is a different business model that has helped keep prices down. It's one of the reasons inflation is flow. Most economists yeah. would agree. So, you know, but it's a different model, and we don't want if we want to decentralize power yeah. and decentralize lifestyle, we don't want everybody to. But, do but, the but, same the, thing. but it's it's classic concentration of power. Walmart they strip their investors of any kind of input yeah. on this, and uh, they go around getting free. A land no, or, this is true. You know, yeah, corporate uh, corporate welfare, right? Uh, driving out small right, business. Right. You know, this book is a lot about Main Street versus Wall Street. Right, and right. You know what? Yeah, that's yeah. involved. Yeah, and we have like twenty four areas of, of left right convergence, mm -hmm. where if we set aside our disagreements, we can finally get something done. It's not like we're each right. winning. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. The, the left and right. It's not right. like it's each winning because yeah. corporatism is a yeah. divide and rule, very domineering power concentrating uh, force. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the uh, a huge area of convergence, uh, I think, among the libertarian right and, and a lot of older line conservatives and many people on the left. And uh, do you define yourself as a member of the left or the right? Or I like to call myself a moral empiricist. Okay. So I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Uh, but um, is defense spending and kind of the military industrial complex. Talk yeah. a little bit about, um, you know, why that seems, I mean, it's yeah. very popular or it's a, a large part of the book. Yeah. Why did the military industrial complex grow so well to a point where, you know, you have somebody like Barack Obama runs as the, the peace yeah. candidate and immediately triples troop strengths in Afghanistan and has not taken a hatchet, uh, you know, or even a fingernail clipper to yeah. the defense budget. Uh, how did the military industrial complex just rise to its supremacy? Well, first of all, it exaggerates foreign perils. Mm -hmm. uh, Eisenhower pointed this out and MacArthur, Douglas yeah. MacArthur. Uh, who because, didn't agree necessarily on much more. Right, uh, yeah. and, and, and it's huge business. So if you can see uh, almost a unwillingness to resist in Congress. Mm -hmm. So you create these perils and you exaggerate them. Right. And there's always some new enemy they're gonna find. Mm -hmm. The latest is China. You yeah. know, Iran doesn't quite fit the bill. It's not big enough after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then you wave the flag, right. okay? And then you pour the money uh, campaign money into the Congress and the White House candidates, and then you show them a map where uh, this uh, Trident submarine has got sub mm -hmm. subcontracts in, in uh, 300 congressional districts. You don't right. want to do that. You don't want to close down your bases, right? So what now, who's going to challenge that? This is where there's the greatest convergence. Mm -hmm. You remember when Congressman Ron Paul teamed up with Congressman Barney Frank? Yeah. In 2010, that was actually a staffed caucus mm -hmm. to challenge the bloated military budget. Right. But the, 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 the industrial war machine has got their hooks into both Democrat and Republican mm -hmm. parties, and so it's how become do you, a taboo. How do, you, how do you fix that? Because people are talking about this more than ever. I mean, Obama, yeah. you know, very loudly uh, rattled the sabers to go into Syria, and he he got pushed back on by There's the Republicans. There's an example. Not, but, not only that, yeah. they were coming in. The emails were coming in like an avalanche. Yeah. And the members would say to the staff, were they coming in from the Democrats or the Republicans? And the staff says, both. Yeah. And that terrifies them. Nothing so, terrifies corporatist politicians and corporate bosses, big corporate bosses, than a left-right public opinion going operational, Nick. Right. The, the key is becoming more visible, which is the purpose of right. this book, becoming more strategic, uh, getting media, mm -hmm. Getting on the table of candidates and political agendas are by there, incumbents. Are there uh, major party candidates that you find particularly appealing uh, that are out there now? Can you name names? Walter Jones, Republican mm -hmm. sure. from Camp Lejeune land in North Carolina. Who to, he had started out as a super war hawk. He's yep. the guy who coined the term freedom fries and right. now he's a big... He's in a, actually, he's, a, he's being primary because he's anti-war now. And he won. Yeah. He oh, won I'm sorry, the yes, yeah. yeah, that's right. No, I mean, Walter Jones believes in constitutional mm -hmm. uh, procedures. 
And as Ed Crane told me, he said, uh, Ralph, I oppose corporate subsidies, unconstitutional wars, the Patriot Act, and the Federal Reserve run amok. And I right. said, Fred, that's a pretty good start for <laughs> convergence, right? <laughs> right? So he's one. I think uh, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has kept quiet on militarism and foreign policy. She focuses on financial industry and Wall Where Street. Where she is flat out terrible. Uh, we, will, we will disagree, we'll disagree about on that. that. Uh, Why do you believe that she has any reason to be against military, uh, military might, though? If, she, if she's kept silent on it, why, why should we trust her once she becomes Well, that, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, she should be asked that. And she, basically, there's almost a loyalty oath among Senate and House Democrats vis-a-vis -vis Obama. Mm -hmm. Just don't criticize Obama. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rose DeLauro is criticizing him on a number of issues, yeah. but it, it, there's, not, there's not much uh, independent well, thinking there. How, you know, we have Obama because we had Bush. There is a large argument out there that we had Bush because of you. Uh, going back to the 2000 election, the most, yeah. uh, hopefully the most tightly contested election of our lifetimes uh, because it took forever to resolve and it, you know, yeah. uh, while I didn't vote for either candidate, I, I, I didn't vote for you either in 2000, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. I suspect it didn't for you either. In the 2000 election, do you think your presence, one of the arguments that third party candidates hear all the time is that yeah. you cost me the election. Yeah. If I'm a Republican or a Democrat, <laughs> That's right. did you cost Al Gore the election? No, and Al Gore agrees. Okay. He, so, thinks, he thinks he blew it in Tennessee, his home state. Mm -hmm. Everything else being equal, he'd have been in the White House if he got Tennessee. Right. And he thinks it was stolen in a number of ways in Florida. Mm -hmm. So, but here's where a libertarian really supports Everybody has an equal right to run for election. Right. If everybody has an equal right, then we're either all spoilers of one another trying to get votes from one another, or none of us are spoilers. We're right. not second-class yeah. citizens because we're a Green Party candidate or Libertarian Party candidate. I have no trouble with Libertarians on that right. one. So, and, and the most interesting thing is, it, it, I mean, the, the brass of these two parties, they control the election commission, the election, uh, they, they control the election machinery, so they keep you off the ballot, harass you, file lawsuits, delay you, exhaust right. you. You're lucky if you have an eight-week eight post-Labor Day campaign to breathe in. Yeah. And the other thing is, they created this corporation called the Commission on Presidential Debates, the two parties, and they decide who gets on and who doesn't. And after Perot got on in 1992, yeah. no way. Was right. anyone else going to get on? That's why Jimmy Carter, for a number of reasons, who's monitored a lot of elections, said last year, the U.S. is no longer a functioning democracy. Do you agree with that? Oh, I do. Oh, well, I, I don't know if I would put it quite that way, but yeah. I agree completely that no third party candidate has ever cost anybody, a major party candidate, an election because yeah. it presumes that all of our votes rightly belong to the yeah. Democrats or exactly. Republicans. It's yeah. like they yeah. own the yeah. votes, the yeah. two party duopoly. No, and, and so, uh, you know, yeah. uh, yes, so you do not feel at all responsible, nor right. should you. Let's talk about something that I think you would want to be partly responsible yeah. for, which is your role in airline deregulation. Yes. Which now, when airline deregulation gets held up, it's usually by liberal Democrats who say this is a terrible thing. Uh, talk a little bit about why you and Ted Kennedy, as well as Alfred Kahn, right. a uh, Democratic, I mean, a, a, an academic economist at Cornell, who is a Democrat politically, as well as people like Bob Poole of Reason Foundation, were all pushing for the deregulation of airline uh, ticket prices and airports in the 70s. Yeah. Well, it was simple. It was not just deregulation of airlines. It was railroads. Mm -hmm. It was trucking. Right. It was buses. And in many ways, trucking gets the least juice, but yeah. it was the most important to, to deregulate interstate trucking. Yeah, and one of the most yeah. successful. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it was what we call cartel regulation. In other words, it, it regulated markets. It regulated entry of new ch challenges mm -hmm. by blocking them. Exactly what the airlines wanted. I mean, they right. created the Civil Aeronautics Board right. in 1937. So in the late 70s, uh, we started getting congressional hearings, and we said, look, I mean, there's no competition under cartel regulation. The fares are too high. The service is lousy. Uh, routes aren't being opened up. Uh, so break it up. Uh, get rid of the cartel regulation. Allow People's Air, Air Express to you know, fly from right. New York to B B Buffalo for 35 bucks or whatever. Uh, and for a while, it worked. Mm -hmm. but. You see, when I testified against cartel regulation, I had two, two res reservations. One, there had to be strong antitrust enforcement, mm -hmm. and two, there had to be safety standards. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there wasn't strong antitrust enforcement. The Department of Transportation approved 32 out of 32 airline mergers. So now you have fewer, fewer airlines dominating the entire market but, than you had in the cartel days. But by the same token, airfares are cheaper in infl inflation-adjusted terms. Yeah. Direct flights are not as, uh, as frequent, yeah. but it's also because people live in different areas. So, I mean, would you, you know, say- It had a lot of benefits, uh, yeah. Nick, for a lot of years. Yeah. But you think right. not so. Had a lot of benefits, now, clearly, but the oligopoly is reasserting yeah. itself. But what does it, I mean, what bothers you uh, other than that there are few firms? Because this is a basic kind of uh, free market or libertarian yeah. approach would be, it doesn't matter how many firms are in a business, yeah. as long as there is actual free entry and no barriers to entry, yeah. because even a monopolist has to act as if right. they're about to be taken on in a price right. war. And if, if airfares are cheaper and if air service is as good or better than it was under the cartel, it's yeah. still a success, even if there are fewer companies. But less and less of a success. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Southwest Airlines, right. it would be. But that's a big but, right? Yeah. 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 But you see, here's where the barrier to entry is. It's slots, mm -hmm. the airport slots. Right. So, I mean, this is part of the airline deregulation. Yeah. It was also to deregulate the airports as well, right? Which are yeah, all basically yeah, local work. monopolies yeah. of government authorities. That's right, that didn't work. So you, you would be in for that? I would yeah. be in for any pro-competition enforcement. Yeah, here's a, an interesting question because, uh, you know, as we're talking about competition, your report on the FTC, on the Federal Trade yeah. Commission, is fascinating reading because it reads simultaneously very much like work by the uh, socialist historian Gabriel Kolko, who, uh, from a progressive point of view, said you exactly yeah. what you said about the airlines, about the railroad barons, that, you know, progressives will say, we created, uh, you know, a, a regulatory body to regulate railroad rates, and that's a big success. And he was like, no, the railroads yeah. created that exactly. to their advantage, and yeah. they froze the market when they were on top. That's right. uh, and this is also what James Buchanan and uh, other public choice economists from a libertarian angle say the same thing. The regulators get captured by yeah. the people they're regulating. And that was the essence of your FTC report. And our ICC, yeah. Interstate Commerce Commission. Right. Yeah, Which regulatory thankfully capture. is gone, right? Yeah, yeah. Re regulatory capture. So talk a little bit about that, and then where where is the sticking point for you from a kind of full-throated embrace of a libertarian perspective on regulatory capture? How do you, how do you without, unless you get rid of the regulators, won't you always have regulatory capture? No, you don't always have because, I mean, you, you win one here and one there where mm -hmm. you beat uh, the auto companies, for example. Now the railroads are, are, are under heat because they're carrying oil and mm -hmm. the, 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 the railroad uh, technology is just not up to it mm -hmm. and there are derailments. So it's, it's a matter of public health and safety. It's mm -hmm. the most fundamental role of government, public health and safety. Instead, well, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars abroad, blowing up countries and creating more sure. enemies and knocking our economy, instead of focusing on the public health and safety. I, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't yeah. disagree with you, and I know in the book you talk about a, yeah. uh, a moment of convergence between people on the right and the left about war, uh, not, not just on defense spending, but overseas wars, and that yeah. one of the places where you guys started to argue is like, okay, if we're not spending you know, 20% of the budget every year on right. defense. Some people wanted to say, okay, now we can spend that on- Public you know, works. Yeah, or yeah. no, we just give it back to people. Yeah, back and to that's people. a real sticking point, right, I think, right. between things. Uh, but and, Until they, they lose a tire in a pothole. In well, here, <laughs> yeah, here's a question. Okay, so the yeah. Corvair, and yeah. I have, you know, and I, I want, you know, the Corvair, which uh, was a sporty car, and yeah. it has its, you know, it has its fans. Yeah. Um, that is the car that you made infamous and that arguably you had your, you know, that was the, your entry into really being a huge public figure that was able to change yeah. policy. You argued in unsafe at any speed and there's no question that cars back then were unbelievably unsafe compared to the crappiest car that's put out yeah. today. Yeah. But was the Corvair, do you still believe that the Corvair was less safe than other cars out there at the time. Not less safe than okay. the Volkswagen Bug. Okay. They had the same handling problem, but certainly okay. less safe than some of the. What Ford about? I mean, sedan. the Ford Falcon, the Plymouth Valiant, the Rene, Renault uh, Dauphine. Renault Dauphine was very unstable too. Yeah. Okay. Because the NHTS yeah. uh, in the early 70s released a study saying the handling, handling, and stability performance of the 1960 to 63 Corvair does not result in an abnormal potential for loss of control or rollover. <laughs> 
uh, and that's also been found uh, by other people who looked at the data. Do you, do you reject that, yeah. or do you say that cars you know, have just improved much more because of mandated safety? Well, they took the worst yeah. comparisons, like okay. the Renault Dauphine and, so, mm -hmm. and VW. No, it was below standards of even that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the evidence comes now he heavily from inside General Motors. Uh, and we rebutted that yeah. report, which was, by the way, prepared in part by a former GM consultant yeah. and with 20 pages in the congressional record. And it's record. true that uh, uh, John DeLorean, who yeah, has right. a checkered history, yeah. but he said, no, I was at GM and there's no question yeah. we knew all about this. Yeah. So. Yeah. And but also the, the leakage of carbon monoxide is indisputable. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. they recalled the cars because of that. You can't yeah. smell it or taste so it. So here's a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, I mean, given, uh, without having kind of draconian government regulation, yeah. do you think that cars would be as unsafe now as they were in 1963? No, there's, there's always an incremental advance. Mm -hmm. For example, Europe had radial tires and disc brakes mm -hmm. when unsafe and speed came out. The U.S. manufacturers didn't. If there was no auto safety agency, mm. uh, probably because of the imports, right. they would have adopted uh, radial tires. How and do disc you? Brakes. How do you do? But a lot of other yeah. things, you know, people would have died in droves year after year because right. I mean, look, they they knew about seat belts in the 1910s. Mm -hmm. There were seat belts in uh, in World War One planes mm -hmm. to keep the pilots, you know, from right. falling out. Uh, but and, here and they guess, resisted it until they were forced to do it in the 1960s. Here's the question, though, because, and, and yeah. this is, you know, without a kind of ideological animus, it's a yeah. question of saying, okay, yeah, you know, there's no question that safety belts save lives, that right. airbags unbalance save right. lives. And, you know, and there's always an adoption period where there's right. fluky results. But why isn't it better to inform people of potential risks and then allow them to choose, as opposed to say, no, at this point yeah. going forward, Everybody has to hew to this exact standard. Well, uh, there's certain like how do you how do you make a cost benefit analysis of pricing somebody out of a market yeah. because of safety yeah. regulation or something and say, well, you know, that's there. There are obvious things, you know, like uh, obvious safety devices that don't cost much and reduce your auto insurance premium, mm -hmm. or things you can't see, like toxic chemicals right. or gases. Uh, you know, you can't rely on people to be. Uh, uh, scientific detectors of what their children are exposed to. But you know, one thing about all these conservative philosophers, mm -hmm. Nick, is they didn't like government coercion, but they didn't like corporate coercion. Right. And corporate coercion now is massive. We have destroyed our freedom of contract with these fine print contracts. They don't compete between, uh, you know, American Express and Visa yeah. or Ford or General Motors. But, I have yet to see libertarian material on the destruction of one of the pillars of freedom in our country, which is freedom of contract. Yeah. Well, I think you know how it's happened is yeah. that nobody reads contracts online, nobody yeah. reads the terms of agreement or and, terms and of service. And you make sure you can't read them. But yeah. it also, in the end, it doesn't matter because I know that I can go from American Express if they start jerking me around, yeah. then I'll go to a Visa bank, and if I don't like that Visa bank, I'll go to another. Same so contract. there is competition. Same contract. But it doesn't matter because the next person will take me, and it's the same thing with phone contracts and whatnot where yeah there's no question that these guys want to ding you yeah. but they have less and less power to because there is more competition but they all have these arbitration causes which takes you out from your yeah. constitutional right to go to court okay which is well, a big libertarian and right. well this is your yeah. your, your biggest thing right i mean you're against tort reform tort deform or, yeah okay very good the, the day in court trial by jury, concrete libertarian philosophy. What was it like, you know, and one of the things that you did that is probably more influential than any of the actual policy studies mm. you did, when it came out that GM had actually hired private investigators to follow you around, there were stories about trying to get you in honeypot situations, you know, where you're caught in a compromising situation. How did that make you feel? And how do you think that changed attitudes towards corporations in America? Well, it was a frightening at the time because you didn't know who was trailing me down Connecticut Avenue going into a, a, a savings and loan and saying that I ch changed a $50 check with 10 fives. I mm -hmm. mean, that's pretty yeah. close, right? right? That's in the detective yeah. report. Uh, however, fortunately, the press was outraged. People were outraged, never mind their political backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were trying to discredit someone who was raising legitimate issues of public safety and unsafe cars. And it helped get the motor vehicle and highway safety right. laws through in 1966, yeah. which had saved a lot of Do lives. Do you think uh, the federal government should have bailed out GM, under first under uh, Bush and then under Obama? Should that have happened? Well, that was a tough one. 
And what, uh, what was tough about it? It was tough about it because if they didn't, it would have wrecked a lot of communities and a lot of workers' lives. Mm -hmm. So the bailout for me was for the workers and the communities mm -hmm. and the suppliers, the auto suppliers. But wouldn't uh, it have... I because, mean, by the way, yeah. this is a company that if it wasn't saved by Uncle Sam, would have closed down. Right. I mean, you're not talking about, well, we'll, we'll close a factory here, lay oh, no, off no. work, right. But wouldn't it yeah. have been better off, I mean, in the yeah. long run, and it's one thing to say, okay, people, a lot of people in a, in a once vibrant, less now less vibrant industry, yeah lose their jobs, and that, that's gone. Yeah. And then we help them until they can get on their feet, yeah. as opposed to saving a company, which we know, you know is now back, you know, they, they managed to name their first woman CEO just in order to have her testify about faulty ignition switches in front of Congress. I mean, why are we propping up a company which has again and again earned the public uh, you know, kind of ire? Yeah, well, normally I couldn't agree more, but they had uh, hundreds of thousands of workers by the throat. But those workers would go elsewhere. I but mean, they would be picked up by other companies yeah, when, and then the people. When you know. would it go but elsewhere? But then are, are we stuck then where we have to, we will, you know, if we live to be another 100 yeah. years old, we will be still talking about the next GM bailout because no, we can't. Because, uh, because what brought down GM especially was their finance arm. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have been in that business. Mm -hmm. They started playing around with derivatives like GE Should credit. Should they be you forbidden? See, if, G, if GM, see, back in the 60s, when GM had like 65% of the market. Right. The because antitrust, of protection. Yeah, the, I mean, because yeah, the imports couldn't come The in. antitrust division actually had an indictment ready to break them up under the antitrust right. law. Now, had they broken them up into five companies, you would not have had this problem of a GM bailout. Uh, by the same token, the, the finance arm yeah. was the only arm that was making money for it. Well, that was part of GM's yeah. mismanagement. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 it's bad management about but their here, cars as well. Should it be, absolutely, yeah. but should it be the role of people that aren't, you know, I don't drive a GM car yeah. and I don't own stock in GM, yeah. why should I be involved in their governance? Shouldn't that be up to the stockholders? and the people who are foolish enough to buy a GM car. Well, obviously, if they bailed out, in return, the, the U.S. government owns 62% yeah. of GM. And what they should have done with that ownership was restructure the company so it never happens again. Yeah. That's the problem. I think the only way it's never going to happen again <laughs> is if they let it die. But Again, a, a point of uh, disagreement, but there's a lot of convergence here. And I, now I want to talk about the most shameful, probably the most shameful uh, episode in your career, which is in November 1971, Reason republished a story of yours <laughs> called You Can Fight City Hall, uh, which had originally been published uh, in The Freeman, a, a great, libert uh, it's the oldest kind of continuously published libertarian magazine yeah. in the country. Uh, and this was about a public housing project in your hometown of Winston, Connecticut, yes. uh, which was going to be passed and then uh, individuals in the community rose up to put it down. What was that story? And, you know, talk a little bit about that. And, you know, what is interesting here is that you are in favor of mass movement, of mass mobilization, and against experts telling people how to live their lives. Well, that's a long discussion. Yeah. But in this particular case, there were empty apartments reasonably priced, mm -hmm. owned by private uh, real estate people. So why, why? And who were willing to rent, yeah, right? Of course. I mean, so it wasn't yeah. even like uh, yeah. they had some reason they weren't. No, they were yeah. empty. And, uh, and so the, the argument was, why should local taxpayers uh, who, who are, pay federal taxes set up uh, public housing units uh, when you have available housing right. in the area? I mean, the whole principle of public housing, mm -hmm. and one reason, by the way, Senator Robert Taft supported public housing right. in the 50s, Mr. Conservative, right. was when there was no housing. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case in this town. So I spoke out against it. Do you, uh, you bring up an interesting question, and it's a, th a huge threat and unstoppable about how, you know, the, the kind of modal right winger is now very different than what, you know, that Robert Taft, if Robert yeah. Taft wouldn't have recognized, you know, Newt Gingrich as a conservative, something has changed, or yeah. Paul Ryan as a, as yeah. a conservative. Um, do you think there has been a similar shift on the left? So, or in the Democratic Party where, uh, I don't know who would be a uh, archetypal Democrat, let's say John F. Kennedy, would he recognize Barack Obama as being in the same party? Or has, has the you know, modal Democrat moved as far out as you would argue the uh, typical conservative? No, actually yeah. they've been very uh, consistent mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and not bold enough. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the total support of the military industrial complex and empire and war 
by Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, is staggering. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would stagger Eisenhower. It would you know, even blush Nixon. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Reagan, uh, you know, w when uh, he called the evil empire the right. Soviet Union, um, Which you would agree with. You yeah, were a critic yeah, of the Soviet yeah, Union. You're yeah. not a you're not a commie. Yeah. Okay. And uh, when he saw 200,000 people marching for nuclear arms control, and he saw well dressed Republicans yeah. among them, he turns around and he breaks ground with Gorbachev. Right. Yeah. So, uh, we, and it was Nixon who went to China. You know, yeah. it was Kissinger. The, you know, the some of us Party. some of us wish he had never come back. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and they, were, they don't get freaked out by challenges from yeah. the right, like uh, uh, Buchanan. Mm -hmm. The Democrats go nuts mm -hmm. from challenges from the left. I mean, we were sued 24 times in 12 weeks in the summer of 2004 to get us off one state ballot after another. Yeah. And it didn't, uh, well, it, it kind of worked, right? You had a much oh, weaker showing in 2004. It, it did work. So. It totally yeah. exhausted us. One time we got a notice to be in Pencil nine Pennsylvania uh, state courts on Monday morning. Right. Um, here is uh, uh, speaking of criticism from the left. Uh, you know, it, it you know, uh, we, people on the left identify heavily with you, and uh, so they have the most criticisms because we always hate our twin brother or you know sibling <laughs> more than somebody on the other side. Um, this quote of yours from the Washington Post in 1984 gets a lot of play on the left. I don't think there is a role for unions in small nonprofit cause organizations any more than within a monastery, uh, a monastery uh, yeah. from the Washington Post. Do you stand by that? And how, what is your general attitude towards unions? Unions uh, are needed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, large companies mm -hmm. who can basically abandon our country, close them down, go to fascist and communist regimes and set up where they put their workers at 80 cents an hour in their place. But in when, your, when, your, when your you non-profit, yeah. non there's, first of all, nobody's making money. Uh, I mean, you don't have a guy making ten thousand dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. and, and second, it's a completely different mission. It's a it's a charitable mission, an educational mission, and it's overwhelmingly white collar. You don't have dungeon factories. Mm -hmm. You don't have asbestos. You don't have chemicals. I'm glad that we didn't show you the the first floor of the Reason offices where we're doing <laughs> all of that. But um, what about in the public sector? Because you know, Franklin yeah. Roosevelt was against public sector unions. Uh, a lot of people were. Should there be public sector unions? Well, I think so for, for things like uh, uh, social services, like there's still, even though there are unions in the federal mm -hmm. government, there's no maternity leave, paid maternity leave. Mm -hmm. You know, they give you three months, a mother delivers a child, three months unpaid maternity leave, and then they have a daycare center at the Department of Education for 15,000 bucks a year, right. probably contracted out. I, I agree yeah. with Hayek and, and these conservative philosophers. I really believe there should be a safety net. Right. And life is too short to spend every li living minute trying to figure out how to make the most basic necessities uh, payable. Right. Uh, you know, here's the difference, probably between libertarians and me. And that is, I believe people should get a, a living wage they should have the right to associate through collective bargaining because that's what right. investors sure. do through corporations and they should get a return on their taxes the taxes should not go to uh, football stadiums mm -hmm. it should not go to you know the 12th aircraft carrier that we don't need it should go back to the common good that people can't do for themselves mm -hmm. like public transit yeah. say like a sewage and water systems mm -hmm. it's simple like that and it's amazing and why I put so much in this book on the conservative philosophers is they got that. They right. got that in the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century. But you don't see that among so-called conservative politicians in Congress because they're not conservative, they're corporatists. I've never met a conservative who calls himself corporatist, right. but I've met a lot of corporatists on Capitol <laughs> Hill who call themselves conservative. The uh, left business observer uh, uh, run by Doug Henwood, who's a smart guy on the left, he uh, finds a lot to like in your life, certainly in your life and in your politics and everything. But Except he, when I'm running for president. That's right. Well, this is everybody <laughs> on the left because the nation, every, every four years, they dust off that old letter saying, Ralph, we agree with you on everything, which is why you should never run for president. <laughs> that's right. yeah. um, but he talked about your uh, brand of humorless hair shirt politics, that there's a lot of pain and not a lot of laughter or a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of humor or a lot of irony in your politics. Is that a fair uh, 
you know, is that a fair estimation of what you're about? Of course not. Five times on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I came in third to Grover Norquist in a humor contest uh, <laughs> a few months ago. Uh, in humor, there is truth. Yeah. Humor is really a great lubricant in hard times. Okay. And you know, some of the people who suffer the most in the world have the best humor. Yeah. And does that include uh, being Lebanese in Connecticut? Talk a little bit about <laughs> what it was like growing up in the, in the 30s and 40s in you know, old New England yeah. uh, as a Lebanese. Well, it's surprisingly placid. Uh, my parents never made, it, made a big deal out of ethnicity or ethnic politics. Well, they didn't have to, though, right? Because that's what the mainstream society was doing. Well, it was a, yeah. a very mixed uh, ethnic uh, community, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, obviously, you, you, get a, you hear a slur once in a mm -hmm. while, camel driver or yeah. something like that. But it wasn't very serious. What, um, you know, how, do, how does that factor into your views on immigration? Do you think that, uh, should we have open borders? Uh, I mean, you don't believe in open borders for goods and services. Do you believe in open borders for people? No, I, I don't believe in corporate managed trade agreements. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't particularly like uh, barriers between countries, but we have to control our borders because we oppress people uh, in Central America. We side with the oligarchies and the status in these areas and so the dictators. So, so, so these people are so desperate, they head yeah. north. I mean, why don't we have a more benign foreign policy where these countries can oh, economically develop? I don't disagree with that, but I mean, if we're siding with oligarchs, yeah. isn't the least we can do is let them come here and have a better quality of life? Yeah, but then you have to ask how it drives down wages in this country. Okay. And you, you believe that it definitely, that immigration in general and illegal immigration, which tends to be more, uh, uh, have a higher percentage of low-skilled people, drives down wages. No, of course. Surplus yeah. labor, it's called, you know, uh, yeah. uh, rather cruelly in the economic literature. The Wall Street Journal. Well, uh, but, uh, no, actually, yeah. I don't think the Wall Street, or if the Wall Street Journal does, there are plenty of reasons to believe that that's not the yeah. case, that illegal immigrants yeah. tend to complement existing areas. But they my go objection to is the H-1B visa, where we import scientists, engineers, mm -hmm. doctors, uh, nurses, when we can develop our own, and there's plenty of surplus okay. uh, technical people in this country. So but you Silicon are- Silicon Valley wants these people to come right. in from the third world because they're more pliable. Do you, or you think it's because they're more pliable and it's not because they're desperate for as many people they can get their hands on? I think, in a great I think, the, I think they're, they're more pliable, but yeah. it's a brain drain. We tell the third world, use your human resources, right. develop your country, grow your markets, and we suck out of them the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the civil engineers, the, the physicians, for our benefit. We're hogs in that way. Uh, yeah, Sorry to I, the hog. Uh, yeah, no, I was gonna say, I'm glad that yeah. Amer before my, all four of my grandparents came over, and yeah. it's like, they wouldn't have been able to come over now. And I, I don't consider, I, you know, Ireland and Italy deserve the brain yeah. drain they had on them. I suspect Lebanon did too. Well, but you don't have to have actual incentives. It doesn't mean yeah. they don't come in. But to have an affirmative uh, magnet to no. de depopulate these areas of their skilled uh, doers, the people who are going to transform the political economy, is short-sighted. Well, I do agree that, or I like the yeah. fact that you're consistent because this is one of the things that I think drives a lot of libertarians nuts is conservatives will say yeah. yes to goods and services coming across the border, yeah. but no to people. Yeah. Uh, and, you, uh, you know, one, libertarians have a... a a bug, you know, a bug up their butts about consistency. So, but interesting, libertarians have criticized NAFTA and the world. Trade yeah, no, world. certainly people like Ron Paul does uh, quite I'm a bit as managed trade. Uh, the question is, is it better than what exists before? And I, I think I, I would certainly argue that we NAFTA is better than no NAFTA. Uh, but let me well, ask you. You need to do more research. I that. do. I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, two two final questions. One is, you know, uh, Nader's Raiders. I mean, you did not just when you were young, uh, younger, mm -hmm. uh, when you were starting out, you didn't just create. You didn't just write books. You created a movement uh, that you know is still felt. I mean, the the people in various uh, you know uh, think tanks and government agencies and journalistic outlets all have some root in an organization that you started or directly descend from you. What was it about the zeitgeist in the late 60s um, that, um, you know, that allowed things to, uh, things to happen? And do you feel like we're in that moment again where anything is possible or where radical change for the good can happen? That's a really interesting question. Uh, first of all, I decided early in the 1960s when I became very well known, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be a Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. I was going to build. I defined leadership as uh, uh, 
you know, producing more leaders and, and no, not followers. Right. And so, and that's the way you produce a movement. The zeitgeist was really interesting. Uh, people's routines at a young age were disrupted by the civil rights struggle, the women's struggle, the Vietnam War, the environmental crisis. And that produced a lot of young people who saw as their life's work trying to better society. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you don't see that now because they're not part of any risk. They don't have to go to Iraq or Afghanistan on college campuses. Uh, and they don't see their jobs going, although their jobs are going, because they're not blue collar workers. And so you don't get that kind of committed leadership so, coming out of there. But you're saying that in the, you know, over the past 20 years with the rise of networked computers and the rise of kind of instantaneous communication and, and radical shifts yeah. in the way people live their daily lives, yeah. um, you don't see that as disruptive in, in a positive way. Well, it is in terms of invading people's privacy and generating huge outlets for gossip. I mean, I was just told there is a Pew poll where the 13 to 16 year olds in this country average 11,500 text messages a year each. Okay, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, I a, so in well, that sense. Well, I, I haven't read that, but yeah. yes. But yeah. I think it's, it's shredding their brains. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that this massive uh, dedication of time looking at screens, mm -hmm. and we're now on a screen, yeah, yeah. here in the hand, yeah. everywhere, you know, TV, and computers. You don't, have, you don't have a cell no, phone? No. Do you use a computer? No, never touch it. I use yeah. an Underwood typewriter. When the lightning strikes and knocks out the electricity, yeah. I'm still working. <laughs> Uh, so how, how are you in a position to know how this stuff is? I mean, clearly, yeah. clearly the internet helped your candidacy in yeah. 2000. To raise money, yeah. not to get votes. No, no, but I'm saying, yeah. the, aren't those two things connected? That is, uh, well, that's so, important. So, yeah. I mean, but you're, you're saying that w the, the shift in the zeitgeist in the 60s yeah. was because people's lives, young people's lives were being disrupted with the threat of violence, yeah. either being killed or if you were a woman, right. not having equal rights or a minority, right. and that the disruption now is not moving towards a positive social end. No, basically it's anesthesia. Uh -huh. It's addiction. Oh, it's, okay. it's internet addiction. So this is like Brave on. New World. The, the internet is Soma, the drug that people drink in Brave right. New World. No, we're, we're beyond the Brave New World except for Soma. Uh, yeah. Ask the NSA. Yeah. Uh, it's a very serious problem. We have to re examine what this technology is doing to us uh, of at all ages. And what it is, it's, it's not getting people to show up. Half a democracy is showing up. Marches, demonstrations, city council meetings, going to vote. And people are not doing that. They're watching screens. Which, uh, and I would be amiss, uh, remiss if I didn't ask you about this. You, uh, a couple of years ago, you referred to games and gamers as electronic child molesters. You, the companies, you, you yeah. stand by that. The companies are seducing the young uh, at their weakest point where you have two, three million people of young age immediately playing a new video game, you wouldn't Isn't have- Isn't that community? Well, that's, that's like fine. going around the campfire. It, it, that, that's fine, but yeah. you, it's a proportion. Do you really want to be addicted to this? I mean, some parents tell me these games take 10 hours a day of some of these kids. Well, if you let them, yeah. I mean, but they, it could be something else, right? But well, I guess as a final question then. I, I, here, here's, yeah. my, here's where I draw the line, right. Nick. Virtual reality is okay, you know, watching internet. But where things really happen is reality. Mm -hmm. And if, if the young generation is spending more and more time in virtual reality watching screens and the quality of what they're watching, right? They're not gonna I inherit the civic engagement and responsibilities of their elders. So as a final question, and I would, I would actually disagree that those two things are in parallel as opposed to they intersect virtual reality, online communication, and the real world are intersecting, but... Except in the allocation of time. Well, here's, a, I mean, so are you optimistic? We've seen vast changes yes. over the past 50 years in American right. society. You've been a, a huge part of that, yeah. uh, without exaggeration. Do you think that the potential in 50 years from now will be, will have moved as far forward as we did in the past 50 years, or will, are we going into darkness? Well, contrary to a lot of opinion, I think science and technology is being used by concentrated power uh, to close out deliberative democracy, to close out thinking for oneself, to increase conformity under the guise of liberated text messaging. And when you go into uh, genetic engineering, uh, controlled by Monsanto and others, the seeds, 
the flora, the fauna. You go into nanotechnology. These are hugely transformative technologies that are not under a frame of democratic processes. So I, uh, I always am optimistic because I like it as a strategy. When I was at Princeton, I studied the philosophers of pessimism like Schopenhauer. I was not convinced. And I see pessimism as a self-indulgence and a cop-out. All right. Well, we will leave it there okay. with Ralph Nader, whose latest book is Unstoppable, the Emerging Left-Right Alliance to Dismantle the Corporate State. Uh, Ralph, I'll look forward to the next book and yeah, the next thank conversation. You. Thanks, Nick.